man to man Combat hand to hand, horns locked Ready for the last stand, elbow drops, kicks fade bang If I connect you, levitate, better settle mate Lights out, knocked out by the heavyweight Hello, it's Toby from Heavyweight MMA. Today, lucky to be with Mr. Dan the Hangman Hooker, straight out of Aotearoa, Auckland, New Zealand. Dan the Hangman is a man that will fight anyone after a six-pack of beer. Uh, a man that's fought from heavyweight through uh, featherweight through to heavyweight, basically fight anyone there is. Uh, Dan, thank you for coming on. Nah, no trouble, Toby. It's good to, good to finally get on the show. Man, uh, it's been a long, long time uh, since I actually met you. It was was a was a, was nearly ten years actually. It was ten years in next month that you guys travelled over to Hong Kong uh, to fight on a Legend FC show over there. Man, a long time ago, eh? Uh, definitely uh, goes back. That's just like the beauty of being a fighter from New Zealand is that you, well, not the last couple of years, but you get to get out and travel. You know, I've seen most of my travels like to. Like Europe, the Middle East, all throughout Asia, the Americas is, is just purely from from fights, taking fights, and it's kind of why I took this fight in uh, London. Like I haven't been to the UK before, so it's um, what else will drag me out there? So I may as well may as well get a fight in while I'm uh, meeting new people and seeing new places. Yeah, man, and that's that's an interesting point because back then, man, you were a record of five and three when you travelled over to Hong Kong, and that was your first. Uh, trip overseas if you don't really count Australia because Australia and New Zealand's only next door to each other you know your first time out of the country sort of must have opened your eyes a little bit heading to a different country to fight right oh we definitely view Australia as a different country that's, <laughs> that's close enough <laughs> the, though bro uh, same culture and everything the, right the spiders and the snakes and the bats so I, I wouldn't class it as the same but I think there's a lot more that can kill you than uh, good old fashioned stupidity in New Zealand um, nah, it's just, it's cool, man. Like it's such, like, I feel like, I feel like that side of combat sports is, um, gets like a whole lot more attention, like, um, like a martial arts lifestyle, um, just like committing to being a martial artist and just roaming around, meeting people, training, seeing new places. Like it's such a cool, it's such a cool lifestyle. Like I love the lifestyle over everything. And then you take that, um, I don't know, that side of it doesn't really get, get shown um, too much in like MMA media. They get too caught up with like headlines and flashy things that take away from it. But it's like, like a lot of young fighters get distracted by it, but it's just true beauty in, in your, your own boss. You can take fights. Like I understand you, you fight for a promotion and things like that, but it's not like, it's not like you have a boss. It's not like you have someone every day that's like running after you, chasing you up, like, oh, get to work or like it's on it's on you. Like you get out of the sport what you put into it. So it's um it's cool. I feel I feel like there's a lot of there's like a lot of freedom in being a fighter. Uh like yeah, obviously like contract negotiations and things like this can get messy, but it is a very it is like a very free, free lifestyle. You feel like um you feel like a bit of a nomad doing it and it's uh like a lot of fighters as they progress further up the ranks kind of you, you forget about that you know you forget about that side of the sport but it's cool to just be back in New Zealand and, and just be be surrounded by your teammates and just be reminded of of you know what you kind of went through to get to the stage man like you said it's kind of like that uh Ronan sort of thing right the traveling the traveling warrior, man. And and you yourself have trained in a few different places like Tiger Muay Thai and, and Saigon Sports Club from memory. Um, was that a pretty good experience, like a culturally, you know, coming from New Zealand, must be just a, a bit of a spin out when you're a young fighter going to these places? Oh, it's the best. It's the best. Like what other, you know, what other reason does uh, like a 20-year-old guy from New Zealand have, have to go and live in Saigon and go live in um, Ho Chi Minh City for six months or, or go to Thailand for a year, year and a half. Um, like it's, it's so, it's so cool. It's so cool. Like I've got memories that'll last a lifetime from all of that. It's just like a complete culture shock. Like once, once you go from New Zealand, which is pretty like it's a westernized country and just going there and just, experiencing like the different cultures of the place, like the Thai, experiencing the Thai culture and then the, the differences 
from that culture to the Vietnamese culture is um it's quite drastic like all of all of the different nations all have like a lot of a lot of subtle differences in their cultures and it's cool to just be there and just experience all of that firsthand because it's something that you just can't you just can't explain to people like they're like what you know what was it like living here and you're just like oh like one time one time we're driving to the uh we woke up and it was like rain in saigon but it had flooded it had pretty much like flooded the streets like a good a good like foot and a half two it was like a good two feet of water had had completely like covered all of the streets so it was like up to your knees so we had to wait till it went down to like a foot foot and a half and then we got on our uh scooters got on our motorbikes and we just like drove through water the whole way like a 20 minute ride because they had to ride really slow to to the gym and it's just you wouldn't it's ever that would never happen in new zealand like the streets would never just flood but everyone just moves on with life like it's cool or being in thailand and then just driving along on your scooter next thing there's like you look over to i remember looking over to my right once and there was like it, there was an elephant on the back of a truck just like standing on the back of a truck with a guy with his hand or like his arm around it just like driving with an elephant it's just something you would never you would never <laughs> the only place you're going to see an elephant is at the zoo uh, like at the zoo in new zealand or australia so it's just like a just a lifetime of experiences yeah man and and actually the ckb gyms kind of had a lot of experience with traveling right like different guys i've talked to there have different links back to like china and everyone everything like blood as an example and obviously adesanya over in over in china fighting on the circuit there and then quite a few of you guys uh back to back to macau and, and hong kong um it and some of the links are probably kind of synonymous with the early days of balmora liga and that with um with uh, Lola Hamuli and um, Sifu Philip Lam and that some sort of links, you know, back to China and everything. It's kind of, it's kind of interesting that a lot of you had that chance to experience like training in a completely different culture than you're from. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's good to see all those, like the different looks. Like I would say that's one of the biggest thing. Like I remember just being in Saigon and there's um, like kickboxers coming over from the Netherlands and, and Muay Thai coaches, boxing coaches, Bulgarian wrestling coaches, like <laughs> just it's a melting pot. Same as um going to Thailand. Like I've been to Thailand on a few different trips throughout my career. And it's good when you're like a young fighter and you're like used to your gym, your style, like even the New Zealand style of, of kickboxing and an MMA. And then you go there and you see all of these different styles. You see, like, I remember it's like 2011 or 2012 when I first went over. And you're seeing like Kazakhstani wrestlers and you're seeing um, like these Kazakh boxers and you're seeing like uh, all of these wrestlers from throughout Europe. Like you're just getting exposed to these different styles before you have to compete with them later down the road in your career. And I feel like that kind of experience is um, pretty invaluable. Yeah, man, I heard Brad talking about that, how he's had a lot of experience with some of the, you know, Eastern Bloc wrestlers and stuff from Tiger. So obviously it does help you in your career, right? Yeah, like just even being exposed to it, like you see it and you're like, oh, this is their, this is their strengths. Like this is where they thrive. Oh, okay, well, this is their weaknesses, you know? Like you're being exposed to these guys and, and um, you don't see them as like indestructible because you see them in the gym every day and you see that, oh, he gets tired. So, oh, he looks pretty rubbish today. You know, like, oh, he's just like me. You know, I have good days. I have bad days. So it's like takes a lot of, yeah, it takes a lot of mystique off guys. Same thing as going and training in the States, like firsthand. And I remember going over there to like America and you're um, in the training room with like these massive names. And yeah, they have, they have good days. They have bad days. They get injured. They get sick. They get tired. Um, and just seeing that for myself was like, oh, well, like they're, they're human as well because you only ever seen them on TV and you just kind of build them up as like a, a bit of like a big mystical character. So it's cool that to see it firsthand and just um, makes it very uh, like attainable for, for a younger athlete. 
That's it, man. Hey, just jumping back to that, um, when you were fighting in Hong Kong, Macau, like I said, it's like 10 years ago. Your record back then, five and three, it went to five and four that night. You fought a guy called Wu Hao Tien in, in uh, Hong Kong. And uh, Kai also fought a guy who's actually become a friend of mine because he lives in Macau, Augustine Delamino. Both of you had losses, you know, your mid-range early career, you know, and your and what are you thinking back then? Are you thinking that it's going to be something that you can actually take up or you're just going to, you're just kicking along, following it for for fun, for building yourself, for getting better at fighting? Were you actually thinking it would be a career at that point? Um, I never, yeah, I never, like, yeah, I was, I was three and three, a couple of wins, got a, the, it was like five and three, got that fight, got choked to sleep, five and four, like it's, um, I had already dedicated my life to it. I remember when I was I was three and three, which is like three wins, three losses in my professional career. When I like tried some job for like one day, and I was just like, nah, nah. Like I would rather, I would rather be broke for the rest of my life and doing this and be a martial artist and and travel around and sleep on sleep on the floor of gyms and um, teach and train and be able to fight and pursue a career which I'm incredibly or pursue something not even a career because I didn't look at it like a career pursue something that I'm incredibly passionate about and that I love and that oh yeah I would do this regardless of the money like this is this is this is truly what I'm passionate about and truly what I I enjoy doing so it's like yeah it's funny from people outside looking in man I've had people like close to me telling me I should quit doing this since I was a 19 year old, like you, <laughs> like I'm 32 now and people are still singing the same song. So it's, that's why it's, it's so funny to me because it's like, there's some of us that are here, like there's some fighters that are here to make money. There's some fighters that want to be here, get in, get out. And there's some fighters that this is who they are. This is like what they're truly about. And I'm just one of those guys like this, this is what I'm passionate. This is what I'll be doing till the day I die. I'll be teaching martial arts and all of this. And that's hard because you can't love something without hating it too. It's like a constant love hate battle within yeah, man. yourself with, uh, <laughs> it's just ridiculous. That's it. I, I laughed when I was listening to one of your recent interviews saying that you, you've got two sisters and one of them's an accountant, one of them was an architect or did masters of architecture. And then you, you want to be a fighter and you're like, your parents like thinking, yeah, yeah, it's all right. Two out of three is pretty good. Pretty good score. Right. <laughs> but yeah. 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 Like they're, they're just too, too, um, like always studied hard, did well at school and you're a bit of a, you're a bit of a black sheep growing up, but, uh, it, <laughs> It worked out in the long run. It's going, it's going better than I ever expected it. That's it, man. It must seem like a bit of a waking dream. I mean, you look at the average, the average martial artist, MMA fighter, you know, they, they can't earn really good money. You know, it's just not part of the sport. It's only the upper echelon that make good money. Right. So to be doing that, to be living the dream, to be traveling, to be training everywhere and doing exactly what you want, kind of managing yourself. Like you mentioned, it must be a waking dream for you. Yeah. Yeah, but it's it's hard to um I never sit there like that. Like there'll be there'll be a time, I'm sure there'll be a time when I'll I'll sit back and I can reflect on everything, let it let it soak in and I'll be content that I have like no regrets for my career without a doubt. But as I keep achieving these things, I keep like setting new goals. Like I never even I never even thought that I would become a, a UFC fighter. You know, like that that to me was a at a, at a particular stage that was an unattainable dream but then you do you know you win the new zealand title and then you win you know the australian title and you're like wow like i can go fight overseas you fight overseas and then to get in the ufc i was like blown away by that and then you just continually set like a new goal because you've achieved that now it's, it's like what's next oh well i want to be a, a like a ranked UFC fighter and then you get there and you're like well now I want to be top five now I want to be this now I want to be that so you as you keep achieving these things you're like constantly constantly setting new goals that's it man hey like you said it's hard being a Dan Hooker fan man I've been following you since uh since <laughs> a decade of, a decade of following you bro some highs some heartbreaks you know um but what are your highs man obviously the lows are going to be pretty obvious I'd imagine but what are the highs for you so far 
Ah, kind of everything. Um, yeah, it's, I don't, like I'm a lifetime, I'm a, I feel like I'm a life off. I'm like a lifetime martial artist. Like I don't take fights when I feel like it. I don't, um, like I fight, I fight. When, when I get offered a fight, I take a fight. And that's just the way it's always been. And that's the way it will always be. And with that comes risk and with that comes reward. Um, I don't know, obviously like three wins at, at home is like something pretty special to me, but making my debut at home, um, fighting and defending New Zealand and then uh, main eventing against Falda as well. Like there's, there's some pretty big ones like uh, that, that I'll always hold pretty special to me, but None I would none over any others. Like I wouldn't put one win as like this is my best win or this is my favorite win. Like they all pretty special to me. Like the to, the New Zealand when I won a New Zealand title as a New Zealand as a nineteen year old. Like that to me was like the best night. That's like unbeatable. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I thought I was the king of the world. I thought I had. <laughs> I thought I had it at that stage. That's it, man. For me, it's I love just love that Gilbert Burns KO, man. It's just just the footage and the, the way you're both throwing at the same time. This is one of my favorite favorite knockouts from anyone. I would say, great, great win that one. Mm. Uh, man, I've got a few questions that I kind of ask, like generally ask people just about sort of training and and that. I'm just interested in your take on it. So for you, man, obviously you're in the upper echelon, man. What, what do you think uh, makes a difference between you and your normal sort of fighter when it comes to training? Or attitude towards mm. training or this sort of thing the like the difference the difference is is so finite in martial arts um and and the difference is not as big as i guess people from the outside and don't spend like every day in a gym think it is and it's just it's just time under pressure like i can't come in i can't come in and then you know, touch gloves with an amateur at the gym with a couple of fights, uh, half ass it and expect to win. Like, it's not like you have to go out there and, and do your best each time. Um, yeah, like the, the, I think that's what a lot of younger fighters don't realize is that it's the skill difference is not much. Like 90, 90% of it is like your mental approach to everything. And, and, the gym is just for learning. Like the gym is just to get better. The gym is to get sharper. The gym is to help your teammates improve and to improve yourself. Like the gym is not to be the best or to be the toughest or, or to be the, you know, the toughest guy in the gym. That's not like the true objective of, of being in the gym and training. Like that, that the gym is to, to improve your skills. That's, that's truly what it's all about. It's when you get out in competition, that's when you prove who the best is when you, when you get out to play. Yeah, man, it's, it's interesting what you're saying about the finite differences between like a high level professional and an amateur, just being in the gym for a long time, seeing professionals doing things like continuous punches on the pads and stuff. And people are, you know, people are thinking, why is he doing that for? He's like a professional, but you know, it's not that much different from that professional level uh, down to the amateurs. And something that I always noticed with you that kind of spun me out a bit is I've seen you on the pads a couple of times. And it seems like every time I've seen you you're doing the most simple stuff, it's like, jab cross body kick seems like this combination i've seen you throwing it in your gym i've seen you doing it warming up here i've seen you on the footage doing this com this combination and, and you just think to yourself this guy's like you know highest level you can find in in the world in mma and he's he's doing these simple combinations like we all do you know like we all do in the gym it's it what makes the difference between you doing it and then the amateur doing it man the same sort of shit Ah, it's just under the understanding and, and application of it. Like the, the actual weapon is, is just the tool. Like that, that's just the tool. Like I can, we can both have a hammer, but uh, if you're a 20 year experienced builder, like you're going to be able to produce something far more <laughs> incredible than what I'm going to be able to do with a hammer. And that's just, that's knowledge and understanding and um skill through time like you you've acquired far more skill than someone with the same tool over a longer period of time so that you can produce something um like far more impressive 
Man, another question, uh, just the benefit of MMA, martial arts in general. I know, I know you've touched on it yourself that, you know, as a young kid with a bit of aggression, chip on your shoulder, you found it helped you to focus on something more positive. Um, what do you think it may, what are the benefits of MMA martial arts for people in general? Yeah. Like everyone, everyone's different. Like having, a, um, like having the gym myself and, and like coaching people myself and directing their careers. Like you, you want to push everyone to their limits. Like not everyone has the same, like wants to get the same out of it. You know what I mean? Like you can't, you can't just cookie cutter in the gym. Like every individual at your gym has a different goal and a different aspiration, a different um, limit and a different capability. And it's a, just about, it's just about pushing each individual like to their, to their limits, like challenging them, challenging them. Because once like a person is challenged, they learn like coping mechanisms. And then those coping mechanisms can be applied to everything in their daily life. Like there's a lot of people at my gym that they don't like they don't want to be a fighter they don't want to be in the ufc they don't want to be a world champion um but the things they learn each day in the gym you know how to how to stay calm under pressure how to um like work hard every day and and commit yourself to something they take that away and they apply it to their you know their work at university or they apply it to their business and so they they take those coping mechanisms and make themselves more successful people. So it's just, uh, I would say the benefit of it is testing yourself and challenging yourself and seeing what you're made of. And then like, I uh, heard a bit with that Dave Wood a little about putting yourself in uncomfortable situations and, and trying to be comfortable in those situations too. Right. And, and that's sort of what you're talking about in a way, right. Just being able to relax a bit under pressure. Oh, without a doubt, that'll that's like something that comes with part of the sport. Like no one, no one likes to be punched in the face. No one, <laughs> like uh, you need to be able to stay calm. Like once that happens, because if you tense up and you panic, you just get tired, and it becomes every worse. Like you're just taking backward steps. So just calm under pressure for sure. Now, now you mentioned Dan that you are like you find peace through hard work and and you know and achieving something and you're driven how does that work man where does that drive come from and and what can people do to increase their sort of drive or you think that's just something that they have to have already um it's yeah it's hard to it's hard to say because everyone everyone is so different like i'm not saying i'm better at anything than anyone else like that's not the way that like i view it it's just like i use like my personality traits to to like the maximum benefit you know what i mean like i'm just i feel very comfortable in that situation you know the like a feeling when you on like the edge of a cliff and then you're taking like a step towards the edge of the cliff and you're creeping out like just to looking over the edge of the cliff and you start going like this like start falling forward like that feeling there where you're like whoa holy shit like that is my favorite feeling in the world like I love to stand on the edge of cliffs and just like <laughs> figuratively, not uh, not in reality. You know what I mean? Like that that feeling. So that's why when a fight comes up, I'm like, yeah, like let's do it. Like let's like it wakes me up and it gives me motivation to get out of bed every morning. Like yeah, it's just it benefits me the most. Like this is um, I'm in the perfect sport. I found I was very lucky to find the perfect sport for me at such a young age. And, and, and that touches on the psychology side of things. Like I, you're saying that you don't, you don't get nervous in fights and you've got to like work yourself up to actually, you know, feel something and try and get yourself kind of nervous or a bit ready for fights. Where does that come from too, man? Because like, 99% of people get nervous when they're going to fight someone. Even the top dogs talk about like throwing up in the bin and stuff before they go out to fight. How do you, how do you, how are you not nervous, man? It's kind of interesting. Nah, wouldn't have a clue. That comes. Um, <laughs> just a yeah, psycho. <laughs> it just comes. It just comes naturally. Uh, of not, yeah, not met too many other um, fighters that don't get nervous. Like there are a couple. Like I've talked to like a few, and 
we're like the same, you know, you have to sit there and, and kind of cheer yourself up and make yourself a bit nervous because, but don't be like a young fighter, like watching this and be like, oh man, I get really nervous. Like maybe it's not for me. Like, no, like nerves, you need nerves. Like nerves bring out your best performances. If you're not nervous, you're you're in trouble. So yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like I would have turned the nerves on, but I wouldn't have a clue like where that comes from. That's just, um, yeah, that's definitely, that's definitely, uh, something that's free. Like, yeah, I remember even getting in the like, fights as a as a younger kid growing up, and you just I don't know, you just smile, you just smile and start swinging. Like it's just <laughs> it's just very 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 comfortable in the chaos. That's good, man. Hey, uh, like I said, you've been you've been coming up for the last probably fifteen years or so, man. Lots of things have changed probably in yourself. You talked about dieting and that before dieting, different things in rest and recovery, strength and conditioning, all that, what sort of things stand out to you as things that improved that helped your game a lot over these, you know, decade and a half or so? Yeah, like those are, those are like all the one percenters, you know, like the, the, those are things that need to be like added and then like consistently touched on. But um, yeah, you can't, you can't get distracted by like the main body of work, which is the skill work, which is, the striking classes, the boxing classes, the jujitsu classes, the wrestling classes, like that is where 90, 90%, 95% of your focus should be. Like all of the other stuff, like weights and conditioning and physio and like you can't, I would never skip a, a, like an MMA session for a physio appointment or I would never skip, you know, like one or the other. Like that, that has to be your main priority is just, actually like time on the mats like time on the mats is is where any young fighter should should like their main focus should be all the other stuff can can be added in at a later time yeah man that john donaher talks about that that he doesn't encourage his guys to be doing strength and conditioning and that that if you've only got so many uh hours in a day then that should be focused on skill work uh what are your feelings about that like it probably makes sense from what you're saying right yeah, like it's just time, time under pressure, time on the mats. Like that's how you truly uh, like improve as a martial artist. You could be the strongest um, guy in the world, but if you're going to have to like keep forcing everything and using that strength and relying on that strength, then you're going to be at a disadvantage in the long run. Yeah, man. Hey, I, before I talked to talk to Shane Young uh, a couple of months ago and just talk to you about uh, the influence of the Maori culture on his on his uh on his career and on his life and that. Do you have actually any Maori blood, man? I don't know that. I just wanted to ask you the question. Yeah, yeah. No, I've got um, Maori blood in my family. Was that the, I said Rangatahi Maori or something. Is that what it is? Is that your, I just heard, heard saw it in an interview or something. Uh, no, my tribes are Nati Mani Opoto. Ah, uh-huh. ah. Awesome, man. And how does that sort of work its way into uh, someone being a fighter? Obviously, uh, fighting culture, you know, and, and the Pacific Islanders are known for being good uh, good fighters in general and, and having that sort of warring history and, you know, you know, people that can fight. Uh, how does that work into your actual fighting itself? Do you feel like it, it influences you? Um, I feel like uh, in New Zealand, uh, it like influences everything. It influences, you know, the culture. Like, it's, it's transferred across... Um, all sports, you know, the, the Maori culture in general is um, like a pretty, pretty physical culture. So, you know, that gets applied to rugby, that gets applied to league, it gets applied to fighting and it gets applied just to our culture in general. You know, you're very um, like very proud people, you know, and then when you're a proud person, you're going to, you're going to, once you commit to something and you dedicate your life to something, um, you just want to give it your everything because you're, because you're proud of your heritage and you want to represent it in the best way you possibly can. And I think uh, from what, from what I hear, it sounds like uh, this sort of sport is a good avenue for some of the youth over there too, right? To, to channel their, any of the negative sort of energy into a positive type of thing, like you mentioned with yourself. Yeah. 100%. Like there's some pretty cool people doing some very cool things. Um, you know, Carl, Carl Weber, my old coach works with uh, a youth program called like Bros for Change down in Christchurch and they do some pretty incredible stuff. You know, they get some uh, 
they get youth and then he can train them some martial arts. And, and it's like I was talking about before, it's used as like a coping mechanism, right? Like once you, once you learn those lessons in the gym or you learn those lessons through MMA, then you can go on and apply them to your schooling or go and apply them to, to a, like a new job you might be starting. Like, oh yeah, well, if I dedicate myself to this, then, then one day I'm going to get better. Um, so it's, yeah, it's definitely beneficial to, to like uh, aggressive young youth. Like this is an incredible outlet for them. That's it, man. You mentioned Carl Weber, Coach Hostile, man. Um, his, his student recently, Fergus Jenkins, just won a world amateur title, right? Did you get a chance to watch his fights at all? I watched every single one. No, it was uh, very cool to see Fergus do what he did. You know, that that is turning into a massive deal, you know, taking out those um, those amateur world championships. Like, there's a lot of guys that have done very well at the amateur worlds and themselves UFC careers and stuff like that. So, yeah, he's called the future for a reason. Like, he's got a, he's got a massive future ahead of him and, and he can achieve within the sport what, whatever he wants to achieve. That's it, man. Great, great skills. Just kind of reminds me a little bit of a young uh, Dan Hooker, to be honest. When I watch him, that was one of the things popped into my mind. Do you see any similarities <laughs> at all, bro? Oh, I think I used to do a whole lot more grappling. Yeah, yeah. When I was a bit younger, I was uh, all arm bars and triangles and taking the back and stuff like that. Yeah, man. I'm going to have a chat with those guys soon. So looking forward to having a chat. I've been trying to get Carl on for a while and he's agreed finally. Actually, to do with bros for change, <laughs> I chucked a donation on there and he's finally oh, agreed. Okay. So. <laughs> That's it. Man, um, I wanted to uh, just quickly touch on your combat academy, Jim. Um, how's that going? And, and you know, what's the, what's the sort of fighter status over there in your gym? No, it's good. It's good. Like, um, it's good to get everyone, like, come back here and, and catch up on everything. Like, I'm lucky that I have, uh, like a good team, strong team of coaches that once I am away fighting and getting stuck out of the country that they're like these guys are in some pretty incredible hands got Mark Timms as a striking coach Karen Joblin uh, as my MMA coach Gareth Ely uh, as our jiu-jitsu coach like Rod McSwain's another coach like I've got some just an incredible pool of coaches like I don't feel like these guys even realize how lucky they are at this stage like any one of those guys having having any one of those guys coaching them is um an incredible opportunity and and they couldn't learn everything one of those guys knows so to have all of those guys at their disposal is um yeah it's a massive opportunity Man, that's a couple of familiar names. The guys that also fought on Legend that decade ago, man. You know, Rod McSwain, Gareth Ely, both fighting over here. Remember those guys? I keep in a little bit of touch with Gareth too. And uh, and also Kieran Joblin. I think I'm pretty sure I watched him fight over in um, in Singapore once on a small 1FC one, one sort of challenger type series. Yeah, uh, good guys. Definitely great guys to have running the show while you're away, man. That's awesome. Um, who are the notable fighters coming up in your gym, bro? I uh, got a few, got a few. Um, Aaron Toad, he's definitely <laughs> one. Uh, XFC Phantomweight champ. And um, yeah, just looking for a fight for him at the moment. It's either, well, still with the border shot, or either trying to bring over an Australian for, for XFC, or if we can't get the border, if any, um, looking for a, even a potential like move up to featherweight. You know, I think the New Zealand featherweight title is. Um, is vacant at the moment, so that's a good opportunity for him. So he's currently uh, five and zero as a professional. So you know he's he's moving in the the right direction with his career. But I've got I've got like young kickboxers coming out of my ears. Like the striking <laughs> uh, level, the the level of striking in New Zealand is like pretty incredible, and it, it, to to build these guys up in New Zealand is is quite a feat. You know, just because the 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 local scene is just striving. Like there's so many challenges, um, regardless of the weight class. So it's it's good to get these guys as active as possible and just keep racking up the fights. It's awesome, man. Man, I don't want to keep you too long, but I got a I got a list of questions. Some of them are just normal questions. Some are a little bit stupid. So just let me run through them and then I'll let you bail. Okay, ten questions. Sounds good. All Sounds right. good. Not as stupid as some of the ones you get. There's a pretty some normal more normal. <laughs> um, okay, three reasons you do MMA. 
easy one to start? Uh, three reasons I do MMA. So I can eat lots of food. Um, so I don't get depressed. And so I don't get fat. <laughs> yeah, good. Easy one. All right. Number two, uh, what's the best part about fighting? Um, I would say just, just like the outlet, just the outlet. Like it just gives you, gives you a reason to get out of bed every day. All right. Um, how does being a fighter make you a better person? Yeah. You just get better at, um, dealing with touch, tough situations, dealing with loss, like a good, good simulation for that is the dealing with like a loss in the ring. So you can apply it to things outside of your, um, outside of the ring and, and have uh, be far better at dealing with those emotions. This is a question on the side of that. If you, because of your training, you're much less likely to walk around and get in some sort of altercation, right? Than you would have been if you didn't, uh, didn't have that outlet. Yeah. Without a shadow of a doubt. Cool. Okay. Number four, uh, favorite movie about fighting. My favorite movie about fighting fight club. Fight Club, awesome movie. Um, who is your hero in combat sports and why? It could be a coach or a fighter. Um, we'll go with Coach Hostile. Yeah, legend. Uh, number six, what is your favorite uh, strike to deliver? Uh, I don't think that one's a big secret. The big old right knee to the head. <laughs> what about submission, bro? I didn't put that one down, but I'm interested. Uh, it's probably have to the be a guillotine. Has to be. <laughs> has to be a guillotine. <laughs> Actually, another one of that, I think I mentioned to you once before in a message, um, Mark Adiva, uh, one of the guys you choked out, out was over here as well. He's he's in Macau, been, been over here working for oh, some time. Nice. Didn't really train with him much, a little bit, but yeah, not too much. Um, what's your favorite target on your opponent? <laughs> That's probably a stupid question too. I reckon you'd probably say the chin, right? <laughs> That's a great <laughs> Straight to the chin if I can. <laughs> yeah, there's some people like the body shots. That's what uh, blood to the body, you know, take take people's soul and all that. Um, if you could compare your fight style to an animal, what would it be? To an animal? I don't know. I think I'm more like a monkey. <laughs> In what just way? Long, just long arms. Long arms, flexible. <laughs> Hang out it. on your back. Awesome, man. I got two uh, two interesting ones to finish. I asked this one to Blood Diamond before. I just love the question. Um, would you fight rather fight one hundred duck size Francis Ngannou's or one ten foot tall size Francis Ngannou? I think I'll go with the duck size one. I'm pretty sure I could beat a hundred of them. <laughs> How would you take them, bro? <laughs> just footballs, just kicks, just kicks. <laughs> yeah, just kick away. That's it, man. And I didn't want to get stuck into, you know, talking about the Arnold Allen bullshit because you're just going to, you're going to get like 10 million interviews asking <laughs> you about your, your thing on Arnold Allen. So I'm going to ask you a, a side question on that. Um, so what's a, what's a wild, but po most positive wildest scenario you can imagine that you beat him? I know like a come out, jump spinning, back hook kick, whatever. I don't know that you took him out. What's the, what's the wildest uh, and positive scenario? But, but been polishing up a spinning back kick. If I can catch him, if I can catch him with that, I'll, and I don't get fifty grand, I'll be quite upset about that. <laughs> but I'm yet, I'm yet to spin in the UFC, but I have been, I have been polishing up a spinning back kick. I can't believe you haven't done a done a spinning back kick yet. That's amazing. All those years in there, bro. Come on, step up your game. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting to it. I'm getting to it. Old dog, new tricks. That's it. That's it. All right, man. Well, I've kept you on here long enough. I uh, want to wish you the best of luck against Arnold Allen, of course. And um, Cheers, mate. yeah, it's been great to have a quick chat with you, man. And, you know, wishing you all the best in your future career. And I hope I can catch you at some stage in the future. But you are pretty famous now. You are on about 10,000 podcasts if you look you up. So I won't <laughs> harass you too much. But here and there, I might try and chase you again, bro. I appreciate it, Toby. Thanks for it, bud. Right. Thanks, bro.